There you go. You want to see the screen? Hello? 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 Can you see the screen? Yeah. Good. Good, good, good. Can you see the
Mr. Richard, 
Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. What's up? So this is this is Tiana. Is yeah. there a missing part to uh, the my plate? A missing part? Yes, my, it says the my play handout, and I, I got the um, I got the sheet that like asking for the calorie requirements, everything. But should we have a sample plate of my plate to make the plate? I'm like I was confused. No, I think what you do is you go on the website to serve as your guide. Okay. Oh, yeah. well, so go on the website and then just put our information, and that's what yeah. you was looking for because I just made an actual my plate. That's fine. I, I, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I got to turn that in because I did that. Well, that's all I needed. <laughs> hey, Mr. Richard. Yes, ma'am. This is Courtney. I was um, want to ask you, how do you submit the homework? I have not submitted any of it, but it's done. So okay. how do I go up doing it? Email it to me as an attachment. Email it as an attachment? Yeah. Okay, thank you. What about the project? Do I email Same it thing. as an attachment? Same thing, yeah. Yeah, because we don't have really, the way it's set up, we don't really have a way to post assignments in um, the, the environment that we're using, okay, like we do in Brightspace. So you just have to email okay. it. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and um, another thing, I was kind of confused as far as the scoring go for the test. Um, 23 out of 26, what is that? What grade exactly is that, if okay. you don't mind? Okay, so uh, take 23, divide that by 26, and then multiply that by 100. Okay. Okay? Okay. And I give you your percentage. Okay. All Thank right. you. Okay. Oh, Attendance time. So hopefully everybody's unmuted, right? Everybody's unmuted. So we'll start. Start at the top. Is Abina here? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Kiana? Yeah, I'm here. Mickey? Mickey here? How about Stephanie? How about Sonequa? Where is it? Zaria? Sierra? I'm here. Good. Deja? Deja? Deja's here? Did I hear from Deja? Diana? Who? Diana? Oh, Diana Cooper, I'm here. Good. Tamara? Marlisha? Brittany? Yes. Courtney? Did you just say Courtney? I'm here. Okay. Jessica's here. Jessica here. Yes. Okay, Nina. Lisa here. Gary A. Ebony. Mariah. Mariah. Abby. I'm here. Just without the lactose, so you can enjoy it, even if you're sensitive. And some people say lactate. Well, I guess here. Here. I'm here. Here. Oh. Here. Good. Tracy. Yvonne, I'm here. You skip right. my. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yvonne, see you. Okay. Yeah. Tracy. Tracy White. 
Haley? Haley here? Did you skip Jessica? Uh, see here. Yes, come here. It's super super I'm me. here. Okay. So we'll go through. Yeah, you skip my name too. Hold on. I'll go through people I didn't hear from. Mickey? Is Mickey here? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Stephanie? Stephanie here? Stephanie Beckham? Okay. Deja Brown? Lamar Hagan? Lamar here? Lamar Alicia? Here. Good. Brittany? Brittany Johnson? Dina Maxwell? Dina McCarter? Charlisa McIntyre? Here. There we go. Jerry Ann McGee? Lamar Higgins here. Lamar is here? Okay. Yep, Lamar Higgins here. Gotcha. Okay. I was just about to call you too. Tracy. <laughs> Tracy. Okay. And Haley Wicker. You missed my name again, Jessica Wooling. Jessica Wooling. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Tracy. Brian, Nina. Nina. Brittany. Deja. Stephanie. Okay. All right. We'll hold it here for now. Okay. <coughs> okay. So we got two things going on today. We got um, we're gonna talk about diabetes and we're gonna talk about nutrition across the lifespan. Okay. Yeah. Any questions before we begin? Okay. All right. So let's start with diabetes. Okay. Diabetes is um, simply a, a term that means um, diuresis, which means excessive urination. And there's two kinds of diabetes in terms of their cause. One is called diabetes mellitus, and it's due to an inability to regulate sugar. And the other is diabetes insipidus, and it's due to an inability to regulate your water, okay? So when we're talking about diabetes mellitus, we have to remember that when you eat a meal, right, is it gonna go from your oral cavity to your throat, which is your pharynx, to your esophagus, and then from your esophagus, it's gonna enter your stomach, and then from your stomach, it's gonna enter your small intestine, okay? And when it gets there, what's gonna happen is that the pancreas and the gallbladder are gonna produce secretions that help with the chemical and the physical breakdown of your food. And then as the food moves through the rest of the small intestine, the amino acids and the simple sugars are gonna go into the blood and head from there to the liver, okay? While the fats are gonna go into the lymphatic system and are gonna eventually end up back in the blood, okay? Now, as the sugar levels in the blood begin to rise, as that sugar goes from the small intestine into the bloodstream, the cells in the pancreas that are called beta islets are gonna get that signal because they test the blood that flows through them and they know when the sugar levels are high. And so they're gonna produce a, a hormone that's called insulin. The insulin, once it's in the blood, will circulate to all the tissues of the body and will cause those cells to take up the sugar out of the blood so that they can use it for energy and will cause the liver to remove sugar from the blood so it can store it as fat or as glycogen, okay? Now, what happens in, in diabetes, there's three kinds of diabetes mellitus. Um, there's diabetes mellitus one and two, and there's gestational diabetes, okay? In diabetes one, 
what happens is that for reasons we don't really understand, the immune system attacks the beta islet cells of the pancreas and destroys them. And so you can't make your own insulin, which means that after a meal, your blood sugar levels go way up, okay? Now, if we don't do something about those high blood sugar levels, what's gonna happen is that's gonna cause your blood pressure to rise. And the reason is that the, the fluid around the tissue is gonna follow the sugar into the bloodstream through osmosis and cause your blood volume to go up. And of course, that puts you at greater risk for heart attack and stroke because that makes it more likely that you're gonna blow capillary beds in your brain or your heart, okay? The other thing that's gonna happen is that you're gonna dehydrate, okay? Because you're pulling fluid out of the tissues and into the blood, what happens is you're gonna pee more. So you're gonna be losing a lot of your fluid in your pee. In addition, because of the high sugar levels in the blood, the kidneys can't filter all that sugar and put it back into the blood because there's already too much there. And so you're gonna pee sugar and pee extra water. And that's gonna cause dehydration, but more than that, is gonna cause the body to have to use your body fat instead of your blood sugar for energy. And when it uses just your body fat instead of your blood sugar, you're gonna enter a condition known as ketoacidosis. What'll happen when that occurs is that you're gonna break down your body fat and as a byproduct of that, you're gonna make what are called keto acids, okay? And what that does, it causes your, your body pH to drop. Your fat literally vaporizes. You, you have you exhale it in your breath and then you lose it in your sweat and your pee, okay? And it's kind of an emergency method for your body to keep you going. Okay, but eventually you're going to have to get some carbohydrates in the tissues for energy. And to fix that in a type 1 diabetic, what we have to do is give them injections of insulin daily, or they have to take insulin as a like a, a nasal swab or a nasal spray. Okay, because their body can't make it. All right, so the treatment for type 1 is daily insulin. Okay, and we give it. Um, when the blood sugar levels get to a certain point, okay? Um, we don't want to give it before or after, okay? Because we don't want the blood sugar levels to go way too high or way too low, okay? Um, there's no cure, unfortunately, right? Because um, once those beta islet cells are gone, there's no other source of insulin. Now, type 2 is different, okay? In type 2 diabetes, what happens is that you lead what's called a sedentary lifestyle, which means you eat a lot and you don't do much exercise. And when that happens, your body makes lots and lots of insulin. Well, one of the things that happens when your insulin levels are high all the time is that um, you're going to start to uh, have your tissues ignore the insulin signal, even though the insulin's there and it's telling the cells that there's sugar in the blood to get to use for energy, there aren't enough receptors on the cell surface to make that happen. It's kind of like what happens when Jehovah's Witnesses knock on your door, right? Maybe the first or second time you answer the door, but the fifth or sixth or seventh time they knock on the door, you pretend you're not home and stay in the house because you know what they want. Well, this is the same kind of thing that's happening. It's a converse. That's not cool to use that as an analogy because well, I am let's say it's a, That's let's not say cool. Door -door I need you to move. Let's say it's a door-to-door -door salesman. The point being, if you don't want to answer the door, then you pretend you're not home. Well, the cells and the tissues are doing that too, okay? They're ignoring the insulin signal and they're saying, we don't care if the insulin's out there. We're just going to let the sugar pass us by. Well, the effect of that is the same. The sugar levels go up, right? Your blood pressure goes up. And because in type 2 diabetes, the problem is you, you're taking in too many calories and not doing enough exercise, what's going to happen is you're going to gain weight. And when you gain weight, the blood vessels get longer. And that causes the heart to have to work harder. And when the heart has to work harder, it pumps harder. That causes the pressure to go up. And that puts you at greater risk for heart attack and stroke. In addition, usually, 
when we have type two diabetes mellitus, it also means that your cholesterol and your triglyceride levels are high too. And what that does is that promotes arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis, all right? And so what happens then is the blood vessels, walls get hard and the, the lumens get narrow, okay? And that's gonna increase the pressure even more, right? Because you got the same amount of fluid in a tinier container, okay? In addition, the same thing that's happening in type one with regard to blood volume is happening in type two. The fluids from the tissues are going into the blood and that's also causing the blood pressure to go up. So you got tremendous hypertension, okay? The result of that is that as the, as the blood pressures go up and as the vessels narrow, as the blood flow tries to move through these tiny spaces in the, in the blood vessels that are, that are small because of these plaques, the blood flow slows down. And when the blood flow slows down, um, what's going to happen is it's going to clot, all right? And those clots will travel. They're called emboli, and they'll travel till they get to um, capillary beds, and when they'll jam there. And when they jam there, what's going to happen is you're going to cut off blood, everything downstream, and those tissues are going to die, okay? So if that happens in your brain, you get a stroke. If that happens in your heart, you get a heart attack right? So the, the challenge with type two, all right, is how do we get your body to pay attention to the insulin signal again? And the way that we do that primarily is through diet and exercise. So what you have to do is you have to lose the weight um, by eating less and exercising more. And eventually over time, what can happen is that that sensitivity to your own insulin will go up and you won't have the, the type two related conditions anymore. Now there are also medications that we can use to control it as well, okay? So it's, it ends up in the same place, but the cause is different. Type two diabetes is reversible. Type one can't be fixed, okay? Now as a third type, which is called gestational diabetes, okay? And in gestational diabetes, what happens is the mother's carrying the child and there's, a, there's a, an organ called the placenta, which is the attachment between the umbilical cord and the mother's blood supply. And that's how baby gets its, uh, its nutrients from mom and how baby's waste products go into mom's blood supply so that toxins don't build up inside the womb, right? Remember that the mother's blood and the baby's blood never mix during pregnancy, but they do have the ability to exchange stuff that's small enough to get through the placenta. So the placenta acts kind of like a filter, okay? Well, what's going to happen is that the placenta, in some cases, is insulin hungry and can soak up mom's insulin. And so what ends up happening is something a little bit like what happens in type 1 which is um, the insulin's not having its effect because it's never seeing the target tissues in the mother's body. And so what happens is her blood sugar levels start to go up and she gets the same conditions that you associate with type one diabetes, right? And so if we were to describe those clinically, they would be polydipsia, which is constant thirst, polyuria, which is constant urination, okay? You're also going to see glucosuria, which is sugar in your pee. You're going to see ketonuria, which is ketones in your pee. You're going to have um, a, a urine pH that's too low, okay? So that's aciduria, all right? And then long-term effects of this, all right, in all cases, um, with the exception of gestational, because gestational usually goes away when you have the child, right, is that if we don't com control the blood sugar, then what will happen is that the circulation of the extremities get cut down, right? So flow to things like your fingers and toes, um, areas that are distant from, from where the blood pump is, they get poor circulation. And what results from that is a condition called diabetic neuropathy, where the nerves begin to die. And as they begin to die, the patient's pain, and then that's followed by 
single sensation, right? So as the blood supply gets cut off, the nerves die, and then the tissues begin to die. And the result of that can be tissue death or necrosis, followed by a condition known as gas gangrene, where bacteria get in there and start to build off the tissue. Okay? What's interesting about that is that um, with, the, um, with the gas gangrene, okay, you would think that that would be an extremely painful condition, but actually, because the nerves are dead, the patient doesn't feel it. So frequently what happens is that people in the later stages of uncontrolled diabetes start to lose fingers and toes and aren't even aware of it. I had a student in one of my classes who was taking care of a diabetic. Um, she was a she was an at-home nurse, and she took off this woman's sock one morning, and three of her toes were still inside it. So the, the woman didn't even realize that um, the, the tissue necrosis had gone that far. Necrosis is just tissue death, okay? Frequently when they have to do amputations because of late stage uncontrolled diabetes, they can do it without any, any anesthetic because the, there is no pain sensation because the nerves have already died, okay? So the bottom line, right, is that the fix for each of these is different, right? For type one, you can't really fix it. You can manage it through getting injections of insulin. Then type two, you lose the weight and you do more exercise, okay? And in gestational, what happens is that um, you have to have the baby. In the meantime, in gestational, while you're pregnant, what they do is they give insulin so that the mom can control her blood sugar, okay? So... The, the, the term mellitus in diabetes, mellitus, refers to um, sugar, okay? And so that's the problem, is the problem with regulation of the sugar levels, okay? Other consequences of uncontrolled diabetes is early onset blindness, okay? Because the retina in your eye is fed by capillaries, and if you don't get good circulation there, the retina dies, and then you can't see anymore, okay? Um, anything is fed with, with capillary beds is going to be at danger, all right? Now, um, what are um, the criteria, right? Diabetes is a problem with either the recognition of the insulin or the production of the insulin. You get higher than normal glucose levels. Um, if you have a blood glucose level that's um, a resting blood glucose over 200 milligrams per deciliter, um, or if you have a fasting blood glucose um, that's greater than 100 to 126, um, then you're in the diabetic range. Pre-diabetes is 140 to 199, and that's where I am, okay? I have pre-diabetes. Glucose is the source of energy for tissue, right? And when you can't use it, you have to go to your fat stores, and that's what causes those problems with making those ketone bodies. That's why, for instance, when you go on... Um, uh, Atkins, or you go on any of these keto diets like uh, South Beach, they tell you to cut your carbs and increase you um, by proportion your fat intake, right? And so what they do is they send you into ketosis and you vaporize your fat, you lose a bunch of weight, but it's dangerous because if it goes on long term, it can kill you. And that's the same danger that somebody that has uncontrolled diabetes is going to face, okay? So the goal of the management is to help the client make the adaptation, okay? If we don't manage the blood glucose levels, we can end up with, as you see there, right? Heart disease because of the extra strain on the heart because of the hypertension. Blindness because of the lack of blood flow into the retina, right? Another one is kidney failure. And again, that's due to the strain on the kidneys. The kidneys are the organs that filter your, and clean your blood, okay? And um, what happens when you put too much of a load on them is that the filtration units in the kidneys will rupture and fail, just like a capillary bed can rupture and fail, okay? Disorientation and diabetic neuropathy are other consequences, right? And then, you know, in, in even longer term, you have tissue death, amputation, and then eventually it can shorten your life, right? Now, at the same time that the pancreas is capable of recognizing 
high blood sugar levels, we can also recognize low blood sugar levels. In the islet cells in the pancreas, there are alpha islets that make glucagon, and glucagon's job is to raise blood sugar levels when they drop between meals, okay? So it has the opposite effect of insulin, and its main target is the liver, and it tells the liver to convert the stored fat and glycogen into blood sugar for the tissues to use, okay? So your pancreas is a, is a major player here, and there's no substitute for what it does because it has a role both in the digestion of our food, right? But it also has a role in controlling our blood sugar levels so that we can have proper metabolism. All right, so if we look at normal blood glucose levels, you can see that they spike shortly after the meal, right? And your insulin spike lags that spike just a little bit, right? And then leads to the drop in blood sugar back to normal, okay? So what can happen um, in a diabetic, right, is that you, you take in a meal, right? Up goes your blood sugar. Well, if, you, if you're type one, you're not making any insulin, your levels are gonna stay up here, right? Um, same as if you're a type two or a gestational. They won't drop back down. Okay, whereas we, because of the effect of our hormones, um, are able to keep our blood sugar within limits that are compatible with life. Okay, so we talked about type one. Type one's an autoimmune disorder. Okay, usually occurs in adults under 30, and they usually have an ideal body weight. They can be obese. Okay, but the cause is different. Okay. In autoimmune diseases, the immune system, which normally protects us from infection, turns around and attacks our own organs and tissues. And it's a little bit of a mystery why that happens, but there are some theories out there. Um, one of the theories is that um, you get a, a mutation in the immune system or a mutation in the tissue that causes there to be a um, an antigen, which is a molecule on the surface of the tissue that identifies it as belonging to you, so that antigen changes, then the immune system might think that that cell or tissue is an enemy and move in and kill it, okay? That's one possibility. Or if there's a mutation in the immune system itself, it might make a bad receptor, which is what's going to recognize the antigen, and it might mistakenly attack the healthy tissue. Okay, that's, so, that, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is um, being exposed to a cross-reacting antigen. So you might have a, a, an infection, like a viral infection or a bacterial infection, and you may overcome that infection. And then maybe several weeks or even a few months later, you end up with um, conditions of autoimmunity because there were antigens in that infection that looked enough like your own that the immune system cross-reacted with your own tissue, right? So after the infection was cleared, you still had all of these immune weapons directed against that molecule, and you had molecules in your own system that looked a lot like those molecules, and that caused the attack to happen, okay? So they moved in and they, they destroyed those tissues. And then the other possibility is that when the immune system is being built, the white blood cells that are part of it are picked out based on their ability to recognize anything unlike yourself that comes into your body, right? Those are called foreign antigens. And it also has to be able to um, tolerate our own antigens, meaning leave our own tissues alone. And any cell that flunks those tests is going to be either destroyed, and this is during really the, the fetal and the neonatal period. So right before and right after you're born, okay? And, um, or it'll be rendered in what's called energy, which is like suspended animation. And so for reasons that we don't understand, it's thought that maybe some of those cells that are in energy wake up. And when they wake up, they cause trouble, okay? So those are all possibilities. And of course, you could have a combination of those things. So there's lots of diseases that are autoimmune diseases you've probably heard of. Rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus erythematosus, um, and type 1 diabetes 
and Graves' disease are just a few examples, okay? So it happens, all right? Um, what, what is normally our friend becomes our enemy, okay? And the problem with an autoimmune disorder is that to treat it, you generally have to knock down the entire immune system instead of just the parts of the immune system that are misbehaving. And that makes it more likely that you're gonna get cancer or you're gonna get an infection, okay? So it's real tricky to treat autoimmune disorders, okay? So type two we talked about, right? Type two is um, essentially up to your behavior, right? So you end up not, not doing enough exercise, or you end up. Oh, great! You don't need to do job. It'll die of war out on you. You end up. Um, Look how many motorbikes now I'm still out. You end up eating too much, right? And so you become resistant to your own insulin, okay? And so risk factors, right? Well, family history can play into it, but hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which means too much fat in your blood, obesity, and a sedentary lifestyle. So this is the kind of diabetes that you earn, right? And then of course we talked about gestational and the, the, the bad player there is gonna be the, the placenta, okay? All right, so that's gestational, right? Second or third trimester during pregnancy usually resolves after delivery. Insulin resistance caused by placental hormones, basically the placenta just mops up the insulin and it may lead to type two diabetes later in life. So it's a risk factor, right? But the fix is to have the baby, right? And then during the gestational to give the insulin. Okay. Blood glucose control is important because we don't want to hurt the baby, right? So we increase the risk of preeclampsia, the risk of having to do a C-section, uh, we might end up with a, a large birth weight for the newborn. We could have hyperglycemia in the newborn, meaning high blood sugar levels, and we could kill the infant, right? And then we can have hypertension in the mother after pregnancy um, due to diabetes mellitus, right? So we want to avoid <coughs> all of those outcomes, right? Okay. Um, hypoglycemia. The prefix hypo means below or beneath, right? So you got blood glucose levels below the expected range. It results uh, from taking too much insulin or an inadequate food intake. So let's say that you're a diabetic, right? Let's say you're a type one and you, you take an insulin shot and there's too much insulin in there. Well, what's gonna happen is that your blood sugar levels are gonna drop below what's necessary um, to maintain homeostasis. All right. Um, if you have a blood sugar of 70 milligram per deciliter or less, you got to take immediate action. Um, we will see uh, shakiness, mental confusion, sweating, and palpitations. You basically, you, your knees will get weak and you'll just kind of collapse to the ground. Okay. Um, children sometimes get this when they're, they're too active, right? And they, they burn up more sugar than they're taking in. Nutritional guidelines, right? Clients should have a carbohydrate on hand, okay? Sometimes they give you um, a source of glucose like hard candy, or there's even um, glucose that's like toothpaste. You just take it as a way of getting your blood sugar back up. Retest the blood sugar in 15 minutes. If it's still under 70, repeat. And when you stabilize additional carbs and protein snack or a small meal, um, so the idea is, again, to get your sugar levels back up where they need to be, okay? Hyperglycemia, blood sugar levels are too high, right? So the problem here is that you're, you're not controlling your food intake with your, with your insulin levels, okay? So in a type one, what that means is that we have a, a mismatch between the, the type and the amount of food that you're eating and the amount of insulin that you've injected, okay? In a type two, um, it means you're continuing to eat the way you did before you were diagnosed, all right? Um, so you have a, a blood sugar greater than 220, 
you have ketonuria and polydipsia, which is thirst, right? So you got to go to your doctor, take meds if you forgot to take them, long-term implications of untreated or inadequately treated health complications are, um, again, as we indicated, right? Hypertension, increased risk of heart attack and stroke, um, and um, uh, ketosis, right? The Samagi phenomenon is morning hyperglycemia in response to overnight hypoglycemia. We generally recommend a snack and an insulin dose in, to, uh, in order to avoid that, while the dawn phenomenon is an elevation of blood sugar around 5 to 6 a.m. It results in overnight increases of growth hormone and other hormones and is treated by increasing the insulin provided during the overnight hours, right? One of the things that growth hormone causes to happen is an increased um, release of sugar in the blood, right? So what happens is that it, it's gonna trigger an elevation of blood sugar in order to promote what the growth hormone does, which is to cause cells and tissues to grow, okay? Growth hormone, you might know as a, a, a one of a class of hormones that are called PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, okay? What athletes do with PEDs is that they take them as orals or injectables in order to get bigger, stronger, and faster so they can beat the pants off of their competition, right? And they're illegal in most organized sports, okay? But what growth hormone does is it causes your skeletal system and your muscles and the connective tissue uh, to increase in size. So you get real big, real fast. People that make too much growth hormone prior to the end of puberty end up as what are called pituitary giants, okay? Most of the people in the Guinness Book of World Records that were tallest human were pituitary giants, okay? You're talking over eight feet, okay? So it's a very powerful hormone. So let's take a look at diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is a complex disorder of metabolism. It is a disease in which the body does not produce or properly use insulin. Insulin is a hormone that is needed to convert sugar, starches, and other food into energy needed for daily life. There are two types of diabetes that affect the elderly. Type 1 diabetes, also known as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, IDDM, or juvenile onset diabetes, results from the body's failure to produce insulin. An individual with type 1 diabetes needs to take daily insulin injections for the rest of their lives. It is estimated that 850,000 to 1.5 million Americans have type 1 diabetes. Non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, or adult onset diabetes, results from insulin resistance combined with relative insulin deficiency. Approximately 16 million Americans have type 2 diabetes. Someone with type 2 diabetes might make healthy or even high levels of insulin, but obesity makes the body resistant to its effect. Exercising 30 minutes a day and maintaining proper body weight for age and body type can help prevent type 2 diabetes. Prediabetes occurs when a person's blood glucose levels are higher than normal, but not high enough for a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Without lifestyle changes, most people who have prediabetes will progress to type 2 diabetes within 10 years. The diagnosis of DM can shorten the average lifespan by up to 15 years. By 2025, over 20 million Americans are expected to have diabetes. So, again, the, diabetes mellitus. The reason that this is a problem, particularly in the U.S., is as we've discussed that we have a diet that's high in calories but low in satiety, and we learned from. Um, nutrition labels last week, that it's real easy to take in too many calories because of the trick that they do with what they call serving size, right? Where they get these ludicrously small serving sizes and you interpret the serving size as the number of calories in the container and you end up taking in more calories than you could possibly burn, okay? And so you end up with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, increased risk of heart attack and stroke. And that's why the number one killer in the U.S. Um, outside of accidental death and even coronavirus 
is still cardiovascular disease, okay? It's problems with um, your heart and problems with your blood supply, okay? Now, this next one, diabetes insipidus, gets its name from the fact that um, you're still urinating large amounts, right? You're still engaged in diuresis, but the cause is different. Here, the cause is a lack of a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. Okay, antidiuretic hormone is made by an organ called the posterior pituitary gland, which sits right underneath your brain, okay, and is embedded in the floor of your cranium. And its job is to allow you to hold on to your fluid, okay? So its effect basically is to increase the retention of water by causing the kidneys to hold on to more of that out of your pee and reduce the volume of your pee, okay? And when you don't make enough of this antidiuretic hormone, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be peeing 90 to nothing and you're gonna be dehydrated all the time, okay? So this can happen as a result of physical damage to the organ. Um, it can be the result of um, a birth defect, all right? And there are some cases where it's drug-induced. And the symptoms, are similar to diabetes mellitus with one exception, right? We have polydipsia and polyuria, right? So we're thirsty all the time, we're peeing all the time, we're hypertensive, okay? Um, we're at greater risk for heart attack and stroke, but we do not have excess sugar or ketones in the urine, okay? Because the cause is not high, sh high blood sugar, okay? The cause is this other hormone. So let's take a listen to diabetes insipidus. Good morning, everybody. Today, I'm going to do a quick YouTube video on diabetes insipidus. And I'm so excited because I'm back to uh, tutoring you guys on YouTube. YouTube videos are really fun. And it's a break from uh, Skype in or FaceTiming or, er, you know, everything else that I do. So diabetes insipidus, if you brought the Remar review, review package, this is in your homework book, okay? Um, and it is on page 13. So if you have your homework book, get it out and you can do it with me and you don't have to do it for homework on your own. Now, I've noticed a huge trend when it comes to diabetes insipidus and you are preparing for NCLEX. And the trend is that you don't know it. You don't know what it is, you don't know what it means. So that's the problem. So I'm gonna tell you, okay? Starting, and, and what's really, um, great about knowing your medical terminology is just sometimes you can learn a lot just by looking at the name, okay? So, and for instance, diabetes. When you guys see diabetes, what do you think of? Most of you are going to say, when I see diabetes, I think of hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. And that is absolutely wrong, okay? And that's a problem that was not corrected in nursing school. Diabetes, the term diabetes has nothing to do with high blood sugar. Diabetes actually means someone who is putting out a lot of urine. So diabetes is a patient who's putting out a lot of urine. The word after diabetes typically will describe what that urine looks like. So you guys are familiar with diabetes mellitus. Okay, so diabetes means somebody that's putting out a lot of urine, and mellitus means that that urine tastes sweet. Remember back in the day, they used to taste the urine to see if you had a problem with your blood sugar being too high, okay? So when you think about diabetes insipidus, if you're thinking, oh, this patient has high blood sugar, you're completely wrong, okay? Diabetes means the patient's putting out a lot of urine. Insipidus will inscribe, describe what that urine looks like. So insipidus is a term that means colorless, odorless, and tasteless, all right? So that's what your patient is going to need presenting clinically. Now, when a patient has diabetes insipidus, they have too little of the antidiuretic hormone. And basically, the antidiuretic hormone tells your body how much urine to put out or how much to hold on to, okay? Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> simple. So your patient has too little of this antidiuretic hormone, what you're gonna see is somebody putting out a whole bunch of urine Okay? Because nothing's telling the body to reabsorb water. Okay? So, patient with diabetes insipidus signs would be patient is putting out anywhere from 4 to 20 liters of urine a day. And if you think about uh, 20 liters of urine, that is a lot of urine for somebody to be putting out, right? So, your patient's going to essentially 
potentially become severely dehydrated. So it's important to know the signs of dehydration, which are <laughs> extreme thirst, dry mucous membranes, poor skin turgor, all right? Your patient will also have um, postural hypotension and tachycardia, all right? Now, um, for NCLEX, you got to know how to treat diabetes insipidus, all right? And the first thing you need to know is find out what's causing diabetes insipidus because you just don't wake up with diabetes insipidus. There's a reason why you have it, okay? And sometimes it's some, you know, trauma to the brain. The patient may have had a stroke, some tumors near the pituitary gland. All those things could be causing diabetes insipidus. So you want to find the cause and treat the cause. Now, you can also give a medication that will act like the antidiuretic hormone and tell the body to stop putting out all this urine, okay? And that's going to be like a pressing drug, like vasopressin, okay? You're the garbage man. It's early in the morning, so sorry. Um, so, yeah, so that's diabetes insipidus. You guys will never, ever get it confused with diabetes mellitus. You know the signs, and you know the treatment. See you later. Okay, so that's basically a different disease, right? You're losing lots of water, so you need to take in lots of water, right? So if you're looking for dietary recommendations, what you want to do is keep a close eye on the fluid intake, right? Rule of thumb during the day is that fluid intake should equal fluid output, all right? And if the fluid output is higher than the intake, you're going to have dehydration. And if the output is less than the intake, then you're going to have hypotonic hydration, right? And both of those can be life-threatening, all right? Okay. So a common cause of death among diabetes mellitus clients is coronary heart disease, right? And the reason is that it's usually associated with higher than normal levels of cholesterol and triglycerides, which leads to the atherosclerosis that causes the blood vessels to narrow and causes the blood pressure to go up, okay? So what do we wanna do? We wanna cut the intake of the saturated fats and the cholesterol, and we also wanna increase the fiber content, okay? So, the client's food intake and weight management need to be um, essentially documented. And then we have to look at their lipid and glucose pattern in their intake. And then we also have to take into account their labs, right? So what are they putting out? What's in the urine? Um, and again, what type of diabetes are we dealing with here, right? Is it insipidus? Is it mellitus? If it's mellitus, is it one or two? or is it gestational, okay? Encourage quality carbohydrates, okay, which would be complex carbohydrates. Limit refined grains and sugars. Carbs should include a minimum of 130 grams a day for healthy brain function, and should be 45 to 65% of your total calorie intake. Now, an interesting thing about sugar in the blood is that the only tissues in the body that don't rely on insulin in order to get their sugar are your, are your nervous system cells, okay? Your neurons can pull that sugar out of the blood um, using special cells that are called astrocytes, all right? And they don't have to rely on insulin to function. So the way the body sets itself up normally is to do what's called glucose sparing, where what we make sure of is that um, if a tissue can use another energy source, like a fat, or in, in rare cases, a protein, then it'll switch off to that, and it'll allow the sugar in the blood to be used first by the nervous tissue, right? Because if your central nervous system and your peripheral nerves go down, you die, okay? So you don't have to rely on insulin for that. Insulin is, a, um, is, is water-soluble okay, meaning it dissolves easily in something that has water in it, and as a result of that, it cannot get into the central nervous system and affect the metabolism of the brain because of something called the blood-brain barrier, so that's why we have to make sure 
that the neurons are able to get their sugar no matter what, okay? All right, how about fats in the diet for a diabetic? Saturated fat less than 7% of total calories, trans fat less than 1%, limit fried food and baked goods, why? Well, again, because when you fry, you generally use trans fat, saturated fat, okay? Same with baking, okay? Cholesterol is restricted to 200 to 300 milligrams daily. You want two or more servings per week of polyunsaturates, such as fish oil, corn oil, or in the diet, fish, corn, wheat, germs, soybeans, or any other legume, okay? Beans, peas, and so on. Fiber, increase that fiber intake, okay? More beans, more vegetables, more oats, and whole grains, and improves the carbohydrate metabolism it lowers the cholesterol. Now, why does it improve the carbohydrate metabolism? And that's an interesting story, okay? One of the things that fiber does in your diet is that it slows the rate at which the sugar is absorbed across the small intestine into the blood, okay? So the result of that is that you don't end up, if you're a normal individual, with an insulin spike, which causes obesity, okay? Because it puts you into fat storage mode. Um, so, if you're just trying to maintain your weight and you're not battling something like diabetes, it's always a good idea to include a lot of fiber with anything that you think is going to have um, a higher sugar content because the slower you take in the sugar, the less of an increase in insulin you're going to see. Okay. And that's going to help you keep your weight down. Um, the other thing, of course, that the fiber does is it promotes regularity, okay? And it also promotes satiety, which it means it makes you feel fuller faster, okay? Fiber intake, at least 14 grams per thousand calories, okay? Other recommendations. Protein should be 15 to 20% of total calories at least. If you wanna go higher, that's fine. But reduce protein if the clients have compromised kidney function. And the reason for that, of course, is that as we learned when we talked about kidney disease, um, one of the jobs the kidneys have is to deal with the nitrogen balance, okay? And proteins have nitrogen in them, and if you're taking in too much nitrogen and your kidneys aren't working right, then you're gonna cause nitrogen buildup in your blood and that can kill you, okay? Other recommendations, eliminate tobacco, cut alcohol consumption, supplements are recommended for any deficiency that we see, okay? So vitamin and mineral supplements. Artificial sweeteners, depending on the type, okay, are acceptable. And then we have to take into account cultural, ethnic, and personal preferences, right? The American Diabetes Association and the American Dietetic Association suggest daily nutritional requirements based on the client's needs, a dietitian is going to work with the client itself and keep the blood sugar levels within that range is, of course, the main goal, okay? So you can see the three parts of the management of diabetes. Very serious condition, very prevalent in the United States and a lot of Western countries, again, because we have a diet that's high in calories and low in satiety. Probably a lot of you may know somebody that has diabetes, okay, and has to work with them uh, in order to maintain their health, okay, have to make sure that they take their insulin, or if they're type 2, that they cut their uh, food intake and increase their activity level. Um, and it's basically a lifelong condition, okay. All right, with that, um, we'll bump out and pause for 15, and then we're going to come back and talk about um, nutrition across the lifespan, right? How our nutritional needs change as um, we go from uh, neonate to young adult to middle age to... Are you taking attendance again? Yeah, I'll take attendance after the break. Yeah. Did you get my um, my papers, my disease project, this Lamar Higgins? Yes, I did. Grade okay. should be up. Grade should be up. Okay. okay. I sent mine to your phone. 
Yeah, that's fine. I saw it. I, I see the phone stuff on my computer because I can see messages on my on my computer too, so I can download them there. This Nina McCarter, I'm I'm in class today. I'm just waiting for you to attend this again. Oh, you okay? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we'll call attendance again. We'll go through it twice to make sure I got everybody. To make sure nobody misses. Okay. All right. So we will be back at um, eleven forty. Eleven forty. All right. Okay. Here we go. Who is you? Is you my boy? Oh. Mm.
After twelve thirty. Hello.
Are you okay? I'm trying to figure out why I cannot hear nothing. Okay, we're back. Let's go through attendance one more time for those that I haven't already gotten. Is Stephanie Beckham here? Yes. Ah, there we go. Deja Brown. Brittany Johnson. Dina Maxwell. I'm here. Brittany's here. Brittany's here. Okay. Dean is here. Who? Nina McCart. I ain't been out there in a minute. Nina, Nina, Nina she here. here. I'm here. I'm right here. Nina McCarter. Okay, good. Is Dina here? Dina Maxwell? Okay. Is there Ann? Here. There you go. Good. Tracy White? I'm here. There we go. Good. Okay. Lamara Higgins here. Lamara, I got you. I got you. Okay. So I don't have Deja. I don't have Dina. No Deja, no Dina. Haley? No Haley. All right. Let's print. How many of these classes can we miss before we fail? Um, you're automatically um, dropped from the course um, if you miss more than two. Because honestly, I don't really feel like I need to be here for the rest of these classes. I don't really feel like this is a platform for your religious or political beliefs. So. Well, I apologize for that example I gave earlier. I was just trying to draw an analogy. Okay. Seven. Six. I think I just missed that. What happened now? Me too. Okay. All right. Okay. We are back. All right. Okay. So nutrition across the lifespan deals with the changes in nutritional needs that occur as we go from 
a neonate to a, an old adult, right? And this really gets to what happens when we start to lose function over time, right? One of the reasons that we eventually stop living is because the rate of cell death is going to end up being um, higher than the rate of cell reproduction. And that has to do with the fact that every time a cell in our body divides, it loses a little bit of information. And once we get to critical parts of that information, the cell can no longer function and it gets wiped out. And when the replacement rate doesn't keep up with that, then tissues die, organs die, organ systems shut down, and then eventually you die, right? So that's the biochemical reason why we die, okay? So one of the things that's gonna happen as we get older is that our nutritional needs are gonna change because our metabolism is gonna change, right? Our metabolism is very high when we're young, it um, continues to stay relatively high as we enter young adulthood. And then after that, it begins to decline. And the reason for that is there are simply um, fewer tissues to replace because a lot of tissue loss has occurred, okay? And as a result, you don't need as much energy. You don't need as many structural building blocks in order to maintain body function, okay? So major changes, right? Pregnancy, lactation, which is milk production. Obviously your needs for energy and building blocks are gonna increase in those instances. Very high in infancy and childhood and adolescence. Those are growth periods, okay? We're making all the organ systems increase in size and in function. And adulthood and older adulthood, what's happening is that you're starting to see loss, right? Um, you get shorter as you get older. Um, you start to lose brain mass. You start to lose muscle mass, okay? And your, um, your skeletal system starts to become uh, weaker because of lack of production of things like new bone. Now, this is inevitable, right? Everybody's going to undergo this if you live long enough. Um, you know, it sounds like a sad story, but there is a way to slow the process down, all right? And the way to slow the process down is to increase your exercise level, all right? And manage the number of calories you take in, okay? So, for instance, for adults 65 and older, they recommend 30 minutes of exercise a day minimum to try and maintain things like body weight, muscle mass, and so on. Okay. Um, and so that's just to keep you alive, right? Um, these needs for um, exercise and diet vary as our body begins to change, right? When you're pregnant, what's happening is you have to provide um, nutrients and building blocks for not one individual, but two, right? Pre-pregnancy nutrition is a key role Early fetal development occurs before a woman might realize that she's pregnant. Good nutrition during pregnancy is essential for the health of the unborn child. Okay. Nutritional demands are increased for the development of the placenta, the uterus, the amniotic fluid, and an increase in blood volume and in lactation. Okay. And why is that? Because you're harboring a new person inside you and their organ systems are growing. Okay. So in a way, for the pregnant woman, it's sort of like she's starting all over again at the beginning, right? Because she has to support the life inside her womb. And that growth is rapid, and the weight gain is rapid, okay? And so we need to take in more nutrients, more building blocks, okay? In addition to the fact we have to prepare the woman's body to nurse the infant. So... An appropriate amount of weight gain during pregnancy is going to prep the mom for the energy demands of labor and lactation and contribute to normal birth weight, 
recommended weight gain um, is in your um, in your book in your um, in that pamphlet that you had table 7.1 on page 33 right um, if, if the mother's weight and the baby's weight are too low then it threatens the baby's um, health and um, if the mother's weight is too high that could be a complication especially during delivery lactating or breastfeeding moms we want to increase daily calorie intake to 330 calories recommended for the first six months an additional daily intake of 400 calories is recommended for the second six months okay now this makes sense because she's eating for two okay protein 20 percent of the daily total total intake protein is essential for growth of maternal and fetal structure, amniotic fluid, and blood volume. Why? Because you have to eat protein to make protein. And all of these processes rely on protein synthesis, right? The main reason that you take in protein in your diet is to break it down into the amino acids and then reassemble those amino acids into the tools of life that make you function. And for a pregnant mother, we're starting at the very beginning. Fats, we want limited to 30% of the total daily intake. Carbs, 50% of the total daily intake. And this allows for protein to be spared and available for synthesis of fetal tissue, right? Major and micronutrient requirements, vitamins and minerals um, are required for blood formation. An example, right? You have to have iron in order to make hemoglobin, which is inside the red blood cells. If you don't have the iron, you don't make the red blood cells, you have anemia, right? Um, absorption of iron is critical. That's why you need B12 um, and uh, intrinsic factor to work together in order to um, get the uh, iron into the body, okay? Um, development of fetal tissue, again, requires vitamins and minerals. Remember that essentially the vitamins and minerals are the tools that the enzymes use in order to carry out those life processes, okay? Fluids from two to three liters a day, abstain from alcohol, limit caffeine, increase folic acid, and the reason for that is to reduce the risk of arch closure defects in the neonate, right? Things like spina bifida and cleft palate. Iron, you wanna to increase to 50%, okay? And fish, um, we want to keep an eye on because of the mercury content. One of the things we don't realize about fish, especially freshwater fish, is that they are, they're a member of a class of organisms that are called bioconcentrators. And so one of the things that can happen, um, for instance, when it rains, is that heavy metals like um, mercury and lead can end up in the, in the, in the stream water and the fish have the ability to store large amounts of that without affecting their health, okay? So they're in a sense acting as filters to clean the water, but if you eat that fish, you can take a heavy dose of mercury, right? And mercury is um, a neurotoxin, right? So it can influence things like brain development, okay? Um, an important point with all of this is that what mom eats is gonna be basically what baby gets. And that's one of the reasons, especially during the first trimester, that we recommend that moms stay away from alcohol and recreational drugs and also people that are sick, okay? And the reason for that is that all of those things can cross the placenta and get it to the baby's blood supply and affect its development, okay? Um, um, example, right? The, the big worry right now is coronavirus, okay? Viruses are pathogens that are extremely small. If mom gets sick with a virus, the virus can cross the placenta and get into the baby's bloodstream and can affect the baby's development, okay? Okay, phenylketonuria is an inability to deal with um, an amino acid called phenylalanine, all right? In phenylketonuria, if we don't control the intake of phenylalanine in people that are missing this enzyme. So this is a genetic disorder. You get a bad gene from your mom and your dad, and you cannot process the phenylalanine properly. What happens is that 
the uh, phenyl ketones build up and it'll result in um, a cognitive deficit, behavioral problems, okay? Um, and it can, um, in the adult, um, end up in death in some cases, okay? So you have to control uh, the levels of phenylketones in somebody that's born with PKU, okay? Um, nausea, right? One of the ways to avoid this are a class of drugs called antiemetics, dietary recommendations, dry crackers, avoiding spices, caffeine, fats, and avoid fluid with meals. And then constipation, you wanna add fiber and fluid to the diet. And the exercise is there to help with what we call GI motility. The idea being that um, the more movement you do, the more movement your food does, the more effectively it moves through the gastrointestinal system, okay? Okay, data collection. Assessments include complete profiles and patients' knowledge of nutritional requirements during pregnancy. Nurses need to review recommended dietary requirements and provide educational materials. So basically you have to tell the patient what they need to eat, when they need to eat it, and what the amounts are gonna be, okay? So you educate yourself and you educate those people that are under your care. Infancy, right? Um, the growth rate during infancy is more than any other period of the life cycle, which means what? You're going to have to increase your calorie intake and your protein intake. Okay? Birth weight doubles by four to six months and triples by one year. The need for calories and nutrition is high because of the rapid growth rate. Weight gain between five to seven ounces a week for the first five to six months and approximately one inch per month in height for the first six, half inch a month for the second six. Head size increases by a third, and this is because of the development of the central nervous system, particularly the brain, okay? In infancy, recommendations are breast milk. Now why? Why breast milk and not formula? Um, breast milk contains not only all the nutrients and building blocks the infant needs to support its growth and development, but it also contains um, antibodies, which aid in defense against disease, specifically uh, IgA antibodies. And that adds what's called passive immunity to the diet, right? Basically, you're renting antibodies from another source while your own immune system is developing. And this is one of the reasons why infants that are breastfed tend to have less childhood disease than infants that are not, okay? When, the, when you're first born, the immune system hasn't completed the job of picking out which white blood cells are gonna serve as your defense against disease for the rest of your life, okay? So what we do is provide prophylactic protection by giving you these antibodies in breast milk, and that lets your child's immune system develop and keep the infant healthy. Okay, the same thing is true of the, the initial secretions from the breast, which is called colostrum, which is very high in protein and IgA, as well as um, antimicrobials uh, like lysozyme, basically um, reduce um, bacterial growth. Semi-solid foods shouldn't be introduced before four months with the development of head control and the ability to sit and the back and forth motion of the tongue, right? Iron fortified infant cereal is gonna be the first solid food and then cow's milk after a year because by that time the immune system has fully formed. Protein and mineral content can stress the immature kidney. Okay, remember that the job of the kidney is in part to remove nitrogenous waste from the blood. When the kidneys are tiny, um, they're not quite up to the task yet of a high protein diet so we want to take some of the stress off of that. And so you do that by increasing uh, carbohydrates, okay? It can't fully digest protein and the fat in cow's milk. So we recommend no water uh, for the first six months, which can interfere with the ability to absorb nutrients in breast milk and formula. Instead, the infant's getting its water from what? From its breast milk, from its formula, okay? Advantages of breastfeeding, 
we kind of talked about those already, right? Um, reduced incidence of several diseases and infections. Why? Because of the antimicrobials and the antibody that's in the breast milk and the colostrum, right? That's the passive immunity you're given the child while its own immune system develops. Carbs, proteins, and fats are pre-digested and ready for absorption in breast milk. It's high in omega-3s, which are essential fatty acids, and that's going to aid in development of things like the nervous system. It's low in sodium. Iron, zinc, and magnesium are in an absorbable form, right? You need the iron for things like development of the blood and the development of the energy production apparatus in every cell in your body, okay? Same with the magnesium, all right? Calcium absorption is enhanced. We need strong bones. But more importantly, calcium is critical for muscle contraction and nerve transmission, okay? So it's not just bone building material. The risk of allergies is reduced and you get bonding from the mom and the baby as a result in part of the production of a hormone called oxytocin, okay? Which promotes two things, emotional bonding but also milk ejection. So there's two hormones that control milk production and ejection. Um, prolactin, which is made by the anterior pituitary, controls milk production, and oxytocin promotes milk ejection. So every time the baby nurses, nerves, nerve signals go up to the brain, and the pituitary gland, which makes oxytocin, the posterior pituitary, um, then is gonna release oxytocin into the blood and that's going to result in increased milk ejection. Okay, so it's a, it's a feedback mechanism. Solid food should be introduced one at a time over a five to seven day period. Look for fussiness, rash, or allergies, or intolerance. Okay, um, again, allergies are basically an, an overzealous immune response to a component in the diet. All right. Um, the idea is that um, normally histamine, which is produced in response to an infection or an injury, brings blood to the area and promotes inflammation. And with the blood come the white blood cells and they're able to battle anything that gets into the body through an injured area or an infected area. But sometimes individuals with allergies um, have, have receptors in them that bind certain molecules so well, all right, that they cause massive amounts of histamine to be released and you get more of that response than you need, okay? And that results in the watery eyes, the runny nose in some places, and sometimes soreness in the joints, sneezing, coughing, and so on, okay? The same kind of things that you would associate with something like hay fever, Okay, suggested introduction of food, birth to four months, breast milk or formula, four to six months, iron fortified rice cereal. Again, you need the iron for the blood. Six to eight months, vegetables, fruits, or strained meats, which can be ready for three meals a day with three snacks. Eight to 10 months, fish and poultry. Nine to 12, table foods, cooked, chopped, or unseasoned. And 12 months, cow's milk, eggs, and cheese. By the time we get to 12 months, the immune system has set up, okay? And we don't need to rely on things like breast milk anymore, right? Okay, things that can go wrong. Colic, crying that lasts for three hours or longer daily. Often the cause is unknown. It resolves by three months of age. What do we wanna to do to reduce the, the problems associated with colic? Eliminate gaseous foods, veggies and cow's milk and chocolate if you're breastfeeding. Why? Um, the gaseous foods get their name from the fact that the, the bacteria that act on the sugar content in those foods produce a lot of gas in the colon, and that produces pain and distension and conditions like diarrhea, okay? Um, this is one of the reasons, for instance, that if you eat a lot of uh, beans, sometimes you have problems with gas because of the bacteria in the colon digesting those sugars and producing as a byproduct CO2, right? And that causes 
the production of the gas in the colon, which has to be expelled. That can produce pain in some cases. Most infants grow and gain weight, even though they have colic. Lactose intolerance is a different condition, okay? And lactose intolerance, what happens is that you're seeing a reduction in the production of lactate, which is the enzyme that breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. And the result of that is that the, la the lactose ends up in the colon where the bacteria break it down and produce gas and distension and pain, okay? Um, not everybody ends up with lactose intolerance. Um, it tends to affect um, different populations, okay? So in the event that your infant has lactose intolerance, what we can do is that we can cut the lactose content in the diet. And there are alternatives in dairy um, that can be used, okay? Examples include things like lactate as a milk substitute, okay? Or um, vegetable-derived milk substitutes like almond milk, okay? Failure to thrive is where the, um, the absorption and the utilization of the diet um, is inadequate, right? What causes this? Well, there can be congenital defects. Um, there can be central nervous system disorders. There can be intestinal obstruction, okay? There can be problems with swallowing or suckling. Um, we wanna look at the feeding patterns and also observe for psychosocial problems and potentially abuse and neglect. Now, these other ones, um, congenital defects. An example would be something like cleft palate, okay? In cleft palate, the hard palate that separates the nasal from the oral cavity doesn't fully seal. And so when the infant attempts to nurse, it ends up getting fluid into the nasal, nasal cavity and can go down into their larynx and their trach and they can choke, okay? And this is thought to be linked in part to a lack of B vitamins in the diet of the mother. So what we have to do is cranial facial surgery in order to fix something like that. Central nervous system disorders um, could be things like cognitive deficit um, and problems with the, uh, the satiety and the feeding centers in the brain, okay? <coughs> and intestinal obstruction falls under two categories, okay? You can have structural or you can have functional blocks, right? A structural block is basically a plug, right? It could be a tumor, it could be an area in the small or large intestine that has a twist, a buckle, or a kink, okay? What happens when the food gets there is it stops, right? And then the pipe upstream of the block swells, and the risk is that it could rupture, it could blow, okay? Um, so for a uh, functional, or for a structural block, what we do is we, we go in surgically and we remove whatever it is that's plugging the system, okay? Um, then a functional block is where the, uh, the muscles that push the food through the digestive system quit working at a certain point, okay? It might be that the nerve endings that talk to them are damaged, or it might be that the muscle cells themselves are underdeveloped or they've been destroyed. And the, the effect is gonna be the same. In a functional block, everything upstream of the block is gonna cause the, the pipe to swell and potentially rupture, okay? So what we do there is surgical intervention in which we join the, the, the part of the intestinal tract that's not working back up to a functional part of the tract, okay? So sometimes an intermediate stage in that is to use a colostomy, right? Where we have the food, um, if this is a block in the large intestine, go into a, a bag that hangs outside the body and is physically attached to the digestive system and then we dispose of the bag and replace it, right? And then with second surgery, we remove the colostomy and then we rejoin the intestine up to the rectum and the anus. Now, sometimes we don't have enough intestine to do that. And the result is that the colostomy has to be a permanent solution, okay? Um, swallowing or suckling problems, okay? This could be structural defects like cleft palate, but this could also be as a result of nerve damage, okay? And so we have failure to thrive there. Okay? So all of these can play into it. And then the psychosocial stuff, um, I mean, a lot of times one of the responses 
to abuse and neglect is to simply stop eating and die, okay? And so we have to call in uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers to deal with that, okay? Now, diarrhea is defined as the passage of more than three loose or watery stools over a 24-hour period. Um, it can result from overfeeding or intolerance of the food. It can be infectious diarrhea. There are certain um, bacteria and viruses that can cause a water imbalance in the intestine. And the result then is that you lose more water than you take in. And so the risk there is electrolyte imbalance and uh, fluid imbalance, which can be lethal. Um, we see dehydration, vomiting, bloody stools, high fever, change in mental status or refusal to take liquids, which we have to address um, by seeing the doctor, okay? Bloody stool can indicate um, that there is um, um, a benign or a malignant growth in the digestive system, okay? And so that could be an indication of cancer, all right? Um, another possibility for bloody stools is the result of a uh, structural block, okay? So what do we do when we, we're working with the doctor to um, adjust the diet for patients that have these conditions? We include complete profiles and parents' knowledge of nutritional requirement for the infant, and nurses review the recommended dietary requirements and provide educational materials so that the patient knows how to adjust. Now, in childhood, the growth rate will slow after infancy. Energy needs and appetite are going to depend on the activity level, right? The, the more active you are, the more you're going to want to eat. Nutrient needs increase with age. Attitudes towards food and general habits are established by age five. And inclusion in family meal time is important for social development, okay? So this is kind of where you... You, you get an idea of what it is you want to eat for the rest of your life, okay? Toddlers between one and three are going to grow two to three inches in height and gain five pounds a year. Limit 100% juice to four to six ounces a day. One to two-year-old toddlers require whole cow's milk to provide enough fat for the brain that's still growing. The fat, again, is used for the production of something called myelin, which is basically insulation in nerve tissue that helps the electrical signals go where they're intended, okay? Food serving size is a tablespoon for each year of age. New food may need eight to 15 times before the child develops an acceptance of it. Toddlers prefer finger food because it's easy to manipulate and eat. Avoid foods that are high in sugar, fat, and sodium, okay? And that's in order to control body weight and also um, not run the risk of things like hypertension. There's an increased risk of choking until four years of age. Risks. Iron deficiency anemia is common. So lean red meats and consuming vitamin C is gonna help with the absorption. So you want fruit juice, um, tomatoes, beans, raisins, whole grains. Vitamin D is important and so they need to take it in through meat and dairy, but remember that being out in the sunshine is important in turning inactive into active vitamin D. Remember that vitamin D production involves not only taking it in in your diet, but also having healthy kidneys and healthy skin in order to finish the process of making this fat soluble vitamin. Okay, preschool about two to three inches in height and five pounds a year. The 13 to 19 grams a day of complete protein. Also calcium, iron, folate, vitamins A and C. Common food jags are short lived. So they might eat a whole lot of something for a short period of time and then stop. Food patterns and preferences are first learned from family and friends around age five. Dangers, overfeeding and high calorie food, so you can end up with obesity, okay? Inadequate intake of fruits and vegetables, so they don't get their vitamins and their minerals. We wanna encourage activity, right? So you want them to get out there 
and do something, right? And that's particularly a danger these days, not only with coronavirus, but with the increase in electronic pastimes, right? Playing games on um, the PS2 or on their computer or on their phone, right? And they're not getting much real physical activity, right? So you wanna go outside and you wanna do things, okay? Play tag, play hopscotch, do something that makes your body move and your muscles work. We may switch to skim or 1% low fat milk after age two. Iron deficiency anemia, if detected, we recommend lean red meats because they're high in iron, as well as vitamin C to maximize absorption. And then the same set of dietary recommendations that we had earlier, right? Orange juice, tomato juice, tomatoes, beans, raisins, whole grains, and so on. Okay, lead poisoning. Lead is a, is a heavy metal, all right? And lead was once a gasoline additive. It was once a paint additive, okay? Um, the problem with lead is that it can cross the blood-brain barrier and get it to the nerve cells and affect their function, okay? Um, so lead poisoning can occur when they place objects that contain lead into their mouth and it absorbs across the GI into the blood and um, we, in, we end up having it in the brain, okay? Lead paint's been banned, leaded gasoline's been banned, but sometimes you get a hold of something that has lead in it that might be very old, okay? And it turns out that for some kids, um, lead tastes good, okay? Which is unfortunate, so <coughs> you have to keep your eye on it. It's the same thing uh, with mercury, right? We used to have thermometers that relied on mercury in order to pick up temperature. And sometimes what would happen when you take the temperature of a child is that they would bite down on the thermometer real hard, break the glass, and then the mercury would end up in their digestive system. And once the stomach acid acts on the mercury, it turns it into a neurotoxin. It is again, lipid soluble, can cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain and can um, basically damage nerve tissue, okay? So we would frequently, if that happened, give the child an emetic, which is a drug that would cause the child to throw up. <laughs> and with that, you'd get the, um, the liquid mercury out of them and you would minimize the exposure to the toxin, okay? School-age children, okay? Generally grow uh, two to three inches in height and gain five pounds a year. Young athletes need to meet energy, protein, and fluid needs. Um, you want to educate and make healthy food selections. Again, you want to control weight gain here, okay? So if you eat more, you want to exercise more. Uh, they enjoy learning how to safely prepare nutritious snacks, and you want to educate them on eating when hungry and not when bored. And this is the big battle, really, that you fight for the rest of your life, right, is that we don't just eat when we're hungry, okay? We eat uh, as a way to deal with stress. We eat for entertainment, okay? And not just when, if we only ate when we were hungry, um, we wouldn't have nearly the weight problems we have around the world, okay, with obesity. Animals are normally designed, in most cases, to eat when they're hungry and not eat when they're full. And that's why, generally, you don't see a lot of obese animals. Now, you do with domesticated dogs and cats, and that has to do with their owners overfeeding them. But in the wild, you don't usually run into it, okay? Um, nutritional concerns, skipping breakfast in 10% of children reduces performance in school. Children who eat breakfast tend to have an age appropriate body mass index, meaning their weight and their height are within the range for optimal health. Okay. For uh, individuals that are overweight, which is 20% and increasing of children, greater psychosocial implications for kids and adults. Okay. You don't want to be picked on because of your weight. So prevention is the key, healthy choices and habits, right? Avoid high calorie foods, increase your exercise level. You get a provider directed weight loss program, but never use food as a reward or a punishment. So here is very tricky, right? Because your, your body weight, your overall body weight is a combination of both what you do and what you're born with, okay? So in kids, one of the things that could happen 
is that you can inherit genes from your mother and your father that tend to push you towards the high end of your body weight, okay? So you would say that they're, they can be genetically overweight. And so it's a bigger struggle for those children to stay in the lower end of their weight window, all right? Because they're battling already what they got from their genetics. Now, it's absolutely true that your diet and your exercise can control your overall weight, but as with any trait, right, which is anything we can measure in the body, it's always a combination of what you're born with and what you do, okay? So with weight, what you're born with sets your upper and lower window for your body weight, and outside of that window, you have disease and then death, okay? And then within that window, where you sit, is up to what you do, right? What you eat and how much you exercise, okay? And so for kids that have, have the window set high, right? They wanna to stay towards the low end of their window. And so they have to work harder to keep their weight down, all right? And stay with a healthy BMI. Adolescence, the rate of growth is second only to the rate of growth in infancy. Nutritional needs for energy, protein, calcium, iron, and zinc increase with the onset of puberty and the growth spurt, right? <coughs> um, females, growth spurt usually begins at 10 or 11 and peaks at 12 and is done at 17. Males begin at 12 or 13, peak at 14 and complete at 21. And this is why, generally speaking, uh, men are a bit taller than women. Part of what goes into that is testosterone levels, okay? Female energy requirements are less than half of males. Males experience muscle and bone tissue growth and females less muscle and bone tissue growth and more fat. And that, again, is due in part to testosterone levels, right? Men and women both make estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, right? It's just that men make more testosterone than estrogen and progesterone and women make more estrogen and progesterone than te testosterone, okay? And those hormones are a big player in terms of um, how, how big you are and how fast you grow, okay? This is why testosterone is what's called a performance enhancing drug, okay? Athletes take testosterone to get bigger, stronger, faster because testosterone increases your muscle mass, <coughs> increases your hematocrit, which is the number of red blood cells in your blood, and increases your metabolic rate, okay? So it makes you bigger, stronger, and faster. Unfortunately, okay, uh, if you're taking testosterone through a needle to be competitive, um, it's also going to end up um, shrinking your gonads so that you don't have a natural source of testosterone after you're off the juice. And it's going to affect the way your brain functions because testosterone, estrogen, progesterone are all hormones that can get into the brain and affect the way it operates. Okay, they're fat soluble. Okay, nutritional concerns. Females between 12 and 18, energy requirements, 2,000 calories daily, males more, right? Between 2,200 and 2,800. A diet deficient in folate, vitamin A and E, iron, zinc, magnesium, calcium, and fiber represents a risk, okay? Uh, you need the fat-soluble vitamins because they help enzymes do their work, right? You need the minerals for the same reason. Okay, and the calcium, right, is a mineral that's not only important in muscle contraction, nerve transmission, and building strong bones, um, but it's a it's a major player in cell signaling. Okay, so you can't mess with the calcium levels, you can't mess with your potassium levels, or your iron, or your magnesium, or your zinc levels, even though they don't represent a huge part of your diet in terms of the, the total amount, right? If you lack them, the effects are very, very damaging, right? If your diet exceeds the total fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, and sugar levels, then what's gonna happen? You're gonna risk obesity, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, okay? Other concerns, right? Snacking patterns, all right? An increased need for iron, females need four to 18, <coughs> and require 15 milligrams a day to support blood volume and blood loss during menstruation, all right? 
So more iron for women. Males between 14 and 18, 11 milligrams a day to support blood volume and muscle mass. Inadequate calcium intake can cause osteoporosis. What is osteoporosis? Basically bone softening, okay? If the bones get soft, they can crack, okay? And that's called pathologic fracture. Um, one of the hallmarks of osteoporosis in, in later age is the hunchback posture, okay? Uh, it's called kyphosis. And the reason for that is the extra weight on the vertebral column in the front, because that's where most of the weight is, compresses the vertebrae and you get this, this hunchback posture that can damage nerves to organs and other tissues, okay? In addition to the fact that you run the risk of breaking bones more easily, okay? So one of the ways to cut down on this is to keep the calcium intake high during adult adolescent and later life, okay, but also to do exercise because bone density goes up the more exercise you do. Um, you need at least 1,300 milligrams a day of calcium and we can get this by three to four servings from the dairy group, okay. Obesity and social pressure can lead to unhealthy eating practices it's like anorexia and bulimia, okay. You might know anorexia as uh, voluntary starvation and bulimia is what we call binge and purge, where you eat large amounts of food and then you induce um, either um, diarrhea or um, emesis, throwing up by taking laxatives or emetics, um, and you don't gain the weight, but you do a lot of damage to your digestive system as a result, okay? And these are basically psychological disorders. Males are more susceptible to using supplements and high protein drinks to build up muscle mass, okay? And I would also say they're at risk for, especially in athletes, um, the consequences of juicing, right? Using performance enhancing drugs to gain an advantage over their teammates and their opponents in their chosen profession, right? And this has um, profound effects on the development of the body as well as the diet, okay? All right. <clears throat> Assessments should include complete profiles and patients' knowledge of nutrition. Nurses should review, review recommended dietary requirements as well as providing educational materials. Assess for eating disorders. Um, look for group counseling in the event you run into things like anorexia and bulimia. And always, always promote physical activity, right? Which involves both cardiovascular and resistance exercise, okay? Okay, we're getting older now. And so what's happening is that the rate of, of replacement and maintenance of body tissues is slowing and the rate of death of body tissues is not, okay? Nurses need to assess the physical and mental health of adults and older adults. A balanced diet for all adults is 40 to 55% carbs, 10% to 20% fats, notice lower percentage, right? And protein staying between 10 and 35. Protein requirements increase in older adults due to a decrease in the basal metabolic rate, which is the speed at which you burn your body fat, okay? Older adults need to reduce the calorie intake, right? You're, you're not burning your body fat as quickly. So if you eat like you did when you were younger, you're gonna gain weight, okay? Nutrient deficiencies occur when calorie intake decreases. Older adults, have physical, mental, and social changes that affect their ability to buy, prepare, and digest food. Dehydration is one of the most common fluid and electrolyte um, imbalances that we see. Now, why is this happening, okay? The bottom line why this is happening is because tissues and organs are dying quicker than they're being replaced, right? What's happening to the older adult is that their, their taste buds aren't working as well and their olfactory sense of smell is going away, right? And so food isn't as appealing, and so they don't eat as much. And also, the mechanism that promotes hunger isn't working as well. And so a lot of times in older adults, you have to remind them to drink and eat, okay? Otherwise, they're going to end up with more rapid tissue breakdown. So this is a problem in what we call geriatric medicine. Nutritional concerns, oral problems like ill-fitting dentures or loss of teeth due to low production of saliva, 
kidney function decreases, decrease in muscle mass, which is going to decrease your metabolic rate, and loss of calcium and osteoporosis. Okay? So look at my plate for recommendations. Focus on dairy because we've got to worry about those strong bones. Um, vitamins A, D, C, E, B6, and B12 can be decreased in older adults. Supplemental vitamins can be used. And the big thing here, regular exercise, okay? Helps bone density, helps hematocrit, helps muscle mass, okay? All adults should exercise for at least half an hour a day, three to seven days a week. And for adults, it's, it's vital for older adults, okay? The loss of lean muscle mass can lead to a decrease in total protein and then insulin sensitivity, okay? So you, you decrease your sensitivity to insulin, then you're flirting with type 2 diabetes, okay? All right, social changes, right? Diseases and treatment interfere with nutrients as well as food absorption, okay? Osteoporosis, an increase of risk of pathologic fracture, right? Meaning the bone breaks when you don't think it would, okay? So we have to, you know, monitor the calcium intake. Um, if you end up breaking bones, they heal more slowly as you, when you're older. And so this gets, makes it tough for you to get around. Arthritis interferes with the purchase and preparation of food. Um, Alzheimer's can cause impairments in cognitive function, okay, and makes getting the food and preparing the food harder. Diuretics can cause sodium and potassium loss. Your vision and your taste and your smell and your hearing fade, okay. Overweight adults are more. Your license applies with the word registration requirement above participating in the National Employment and Training Program and I'm hearing something. Hold on. Um, overweight adults are more likely to develop diabetes mellitus and um, cardiovascular disease. Okay. Social isolation, loss of a partner, mental deterioration can cause poor nutrition. If you're depressed, you don't either overeat or you don't eat, okay? So we want socialization, and this is why um, elder care is a major growing industry, right? Fixed incomes can cause problems. So we deal with that with things like meals on wheels and food banks, okay? <coughs> okay, fluid intake, right? You have to remind older individuals to get the fluid they need. Solid food provides varying amounts of water, so we encourage natural juices and discourage um, sweetened soda pop and other drinks with caffeine. Um, assessments include complete profiles and patients, knowledge of nutritional requirements, medical history, uh, what meds they're taking, how mobile they are, their mental and financial status, and nurses need to review the dietary requirements and provide educational materials, okay? So this is really the part of life that's the greatest challenge, right? Which is um, the, uh, the older individual, okay? That is the part of the population that's increasing right now because the baby boomers are entering um, this stage of life. And this is one of the reasons why the healthcare field is expanding in this area, geriatric care, okay? Um, there's more of us to take care of, so there's more job opportunities in geriatric care, okay? So it's very challenging. Geriatric medicine is a challenge. Geriatric uh, nutritional management is a major challenge as well, okay? All right, um, that brings this session to a close. Um, are there any questions before we bump out, I will post the, um, the lecture and the homework materials, I'll send them to you. Um, and then we will be starting to get ready next week for um, your, your final exam, okay? And that's gonna cover uh, everything up through last week, okay? The stuff we talked about, um, exam three, will cover everything up through last week. The stuff we talked about today um, is only going to be on the final, all right? So let me know if you have questions. Um, 
Let me know if your attendance needs to be adjusted. All right. Okay. And other than that, um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. I wanted to know whether you have received all my homework yeah. or my assignment because I don't have the feedback. If not, I can resend it to you again. I don't know. You should, if you check your grades, you should see that they're, they've all been taken care of. Mr. Converse. I yes, can see the grade on the computer. You should be able to see them. They, they've all been scored up through BMI. I just send them my project uh, through email. Is that okay? Yeah. That's, okay. that's how you need to send them because we can't okay. post to, um, it's not Compass, but um, um, the, uh, the, 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 the website that you guys are using doesn't allow you to post assignments. Okay, so you have to send them to me in order. Mr. Converse. Yes, ma'am. Just add me to you. I, uh, I think you marked me absent for last week and I was in class. Okay, email me so I can fix that. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions before we bump out? Um, no, so Not far. Enough. All right. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay.